Good afternoon. It's 4-13, Wednesday, September 18th, 2019. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm Joe Bianca, Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I still think Easy Goer was a better horse than Sunday Silence. And this is Alan Carrasso, Managing Editor of the TDN. And... Hmm. I don't know how I think about that. <laughs> okay. We can debate that in a future right. podcast. Well, how about a, that? I don't got any beer bets yeah. a minute into the <laughs> podcast this week. All right. So we found out last week why we timestamp these podcasts at the top. And the reason is a story like Justifies breaking about two hours after we recorded last week. Reported in the New York Times by Joe Drape that Justify tested positive for scopolamine. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, after the Santa Anita Derby, and there's a lot of conflicting reports on whether or not he should have been disqualified or shouldn't have been disqualified, how much of a performance-enhancing agent it is, if at all, whether it was environmental contamination. So there's a lot lot up in there, a lot of contradicting explanations going on right now. But I thought I would open it up to the floor. And, Bill, why don't you start us? What were your main impressions when that story broke? Story is a load of crap. This is my main impression. All right. Um, where do you want me to start? I've got five major uh, problems with the story. Um, let's just start, and maybe we could take one at a time, I guess, because it, w- it would take me um, 10, 15 minutes to get through this. So, first of all, Drape in the story uh, had a couple conclusions. The main one, or actually, Uh, the main one or two was, number one, that the horse should have been disqualified from the Santa Anita Derby for testing positive for this drug. And therefore, if he had, he would not have had enough points to run in the Kentucky Derby. Remember, it was only his third lifetime starts. He would have had zero points. Um, That's absurd. Nobody has ever seen in the history of horse racing any drug positive adjudicated in 28 days. Um, You need to do split samples. You need to do investigative work. Uh, You need to do everything possible to make make sure that the ruling is fair and that there really was the prohibited substance in the horse. So 28 days, it's just not going to happen. It never has. So if, in fact, this was even a serious drug, which we'll get to that later, it was not, there is no way that Santa Anita would have been able, or the California Horse Racing Board, would have been able to conduct this test within 28 days, and therefore they had no reason to take the victory away from Justify as of the first Saturday in May. There's no case to be made whatsoever for this horse not being able to run the Kentucky Derby. Well, you know, I guess um, the question is whether or when connections knew about the positive. So um, I agree, obviously, it's difficult to, to come to any conclusion or to adjudicate these things in that in that tight of a time frame. But um, if Elliot Walden is saying that they were aware about it from April or a couple weeks after the Sandy Derby, um, I guess that calls into question just what the timeline is. Well, I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, I mean, there's no database for, for what timelines are for for drug positives. But um, Rick Arthur, the equine medical director for the California Horse Racing Board, told me that in the ballpark is 60 to 90 days. And, you know, look, I, I'd love to cite, uh, you know, 50 cases where it took 128 days versus 74 days. But, you know, I I've never seen one. Uh, go from the time the, the, the horse races, the, the urine and or blood test is taken to the time uh, that it is made public information, 28 days. I mean, they'll notify the trainer the next day, I suppose. But then this trainer still has the right, you know, split samples. And you, 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 you have to take this stuff seriously. You have to cross all uh, the T's, dot all the I's. And another quote out of um, you know, the California Horse Racing Board was, it would have been irresponsible of us if we rushed through this uh, simply because, you know, of, of, of who the horse was and, and the matter of the Kentucky Derby. So, you know, I'm sticking to my guns on that. Um, to, to say that, that it should have been done within the 28 days, um, it just was not going to happen and is not reasonable. To me, the, the, the main issue is I compare it a lot to the Kentucky Derby disqualification, which 
I think was a no brainer DQ. Some people might argue with that, but I, I would think most people would say that that there was significant interference. The problem with it was after the race when the stewards come up there and give a forty five second statement and don't take any questions. That's not a good look, you know, especially for people tuning in casually and watching this 22 minute deliberation about whether or not to DQ the horse. And then there really are no answers once the DQ comes. Now, as racing fans, we're pretty used to that where we hardly ever get a really good explanation for a disqualification. But I just think the lack of transparency was a problem. And I, th- I feel like that's my problem with this here is that for this to come out a year and a half later in a Joe Drape article in The New York Times where nobody had heard hide nor hair of this news since the Santa Anita Derby last year, to me, that's a problem. And I'm not going to say that the CHRB was covering anything up or that they did anything improper. They might have followed all the right protocols, but I think it gives you an optics problem when this is this news is breaking like this, this far down the line. And it's just not a good look for racing. And it sucks that now this is yet another story that breaks into the mainstream that is not a good look for racing. And no one's going to, th- no one's going to hear about all the, the minutia of the test and the environmental contamination and all this stuff. All they're going to hear is Kentucky Derby winner, triple crown winner drugged. And I think it's a problem that racing didn't have a chance to get out in front of, on this thing. Yeah. I mean, I can, I completely agree. I mean, but the, the, the much bigger issue is, is the way that the CHRB handled it. As you said, we're not privy to what uh, what their SOP is. Um, you know, for all we know, they handle it exactly how they handle every case. Um, but you do wish, and there, I mean, there are other jurisdictions in the world that um, that these things are in the wide open. There are detailed stewards reports, and um, you know, down to the letter of exactly what hoops they're jumping through, and what the discussions are that they're having, and and what determinations are made. So. I agree with you. It's a, a very, very bad look. Well, count me as number three, agreeing with, with uh, the three of you. You know, again, we don't know what their standard operating procedure is either, but you can't treat this like it was the third race on a, th- a Thursday afternoon at Golden Gate Fields. This was a horse that was going for the Triple Crown, and they had to get this information out They should have put everything out on the table. And if they had done that, they could have got ahead of the story. They could have explained to people, hey, look, number one, it's going to take us time to investigate this. Number two, and this is a subject we haven't touched upon. I want to get back to it. This is not a serious drug. That's another problem with this. You you said that you you use the perfect word, Joe, the minutia, the general public you know, obviously perceives this as somebody sticking a needle into this horse and injecting him with God knows what to make him run like they had a rocket tied to his back. This is some weed that was, uh, that everybody, just about everybody says has no performance enhancing effects on a horse whatsoever. So if they would have, number one, told the public right away, hey, this horse tested positive in the San Anita Derby, and we're dealing with it. And then when they decided to drop the case altogether, again, told everybody, then they would have been up front, and this never would have happened. We never would have had this, you know, firestorm that we had. I don't think they had anything to cover up, but they treated it like they had something to cover up, and they just used very poor judgment. And if they had handled this differently, we'd probably be talking about something else this week because the story would have happened right away. It would have been a story for two or three days and gone away. Mm-hmm. There's been no good reason explained to me as to why this took so long for this to come out. And Well, it never would have come out if it weren't well, for the, yeah, exactly. the reporting exactly. of the newspaper reporter, right. Right. who yeah. I disparaged earlier. I still don't like his story, yeah, I mean, but it, never, it ne- never would have come out if, if not. Somebody leaked it to him. Yeah, I mean, I mean, somebody was, wanted, wanted to embarrass him. And there were definitely problems with the story. You know, he's, 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 he's basing a lot of this on testimony from a Kentucky veterinarian as opposed to the people that were dealing with the issue you know, face-to-face. So... That's a, that's an issue, and I think a lot of people have problems with him. They think he's an anti-racing racing writer, so I, I think the 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 source isn't great here. But it's I mean somebody had to break it eventually. 
Well, I'm glad you said that because that was the other, I think, main problem with the story. Um, He found one person and one person only who basically threw Justify and Baffert under the bus, and that was Rick Sams, who said he thought the horse was, uh, he didn't use the term doped, but was given the drug to improve uh, his performance. Um, Everybody else that I've uh, seen quoted has said the exact opposite said no way Th- this stuff is, is you know winds up in this hay and straw all the time um it's just environmental contamination it doesn't do a thing to improve the horse's performance now rick sams worked at the time for the kentucky horse racing commission so how does he have any knowledge whatsoever about a test done by the california horse racing board and to make it even worse Churchill Downs came out with a statement after the story broke saying that, A, they didn't know anything about this positive, and neither did the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. So, you know, one and one does not equal three here. It's somebody's, you know, where is the information um, and who is who is right, who is wrong? I don't see how Sam's had any access to any of this information. And as a reporter, I've tried to call him and contact him, and he, he won't return my phone calls. So, you know, I, I, he's got some explaining to do. Yeah. Well, and yeah, to your point, like, and to my point as well, that the lack of transparency here, I think, leads to this kind of vacuum where nobody knows anything. Nobody knows the time frame. No, there was a, I think Rick Arthur said that there were other horses who tested positive, and that's kind of why they threw out the test, that it did seem like, a, like an environmental contamination thing. But what are those other horses' names? Like, what's their record? Have they had other positive? Who's the trainer? Like, there's so much, there's so little information that has been released until this story broke that it, it, it leaves a, a lot of gaps to be filled by people's imaginations. So there's two scenarios here. Number one is it's environmental contamination. It was an accident and it didn't affect the horse's performance. The, the, number two is the horse was drugged in an attempt to improve his performance and win the race. Drape finds one person and one person only to come to the conclusion that the horse was drugged in order to benefit his performance in the race. And this is as flimsy a source as you possibly can have to, to, and he's the only one making the accusation. Um, and, and, you know, again, all the things that I just pointed out about there's the it, it just it just doesn't add up. Um, you know, what did he sneak into the California Horse Racing Board one night like Watergate and go through <laughs> all their files and everything? Said, oh my God, here he tested for you know I, I never know what a nanogram is or what the heck is, but he was the one who said, came up with this number three hundred nanograms. Now that three hundred. Um, which I don't know what that's, you, you know, uh, those numbers mean nothing to me. But now... Nano means small. That's what yeah. I know. That's as far as <laughs> I go. Every, now, every single paper in the country and TV show, et cetera, is just reporting that as fact. Mm-hmm. Well... We don't know that that's fact. We only know that this one guy says it's so, and we have no idea how this guy came up with this information. Yeah. You know, I guess part of that um, is... Uh, sort of lies with the CHRB. I, in, in no way does the CHRB have an obligation to thoroughbred horse racing or or the common racing fan. But, I mean, they certainly could do their part by being transparent, by spelling things out, and, and helping to, to foster trust in, in the game. I mean, you know, 90% of the people, like you said, Jar, are seeing this story, and they just assume Bob Baffert's guilt. Guilty of I'd this. say 98, 99%. I mean, right. other than inside horse racing people, uh, you know, and that's such a shame because, you know, horse racing has gotten so many black eyes and a lot of them are deserved. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a terrible black eye. I mean, the man on the street knows about this. Um, you know, the, the man on the street couldn't tell you name one horse that's running in the cotillion Saturday at, at parks, but they, they know that, hey, the Triple Crown winner was drugged. And that's really all they know. And that just is not the case. It's not the story. So in this case, horse racing got a very undeserved black eye. And fortunately, you know, we don't have a spokesman. We don't have a commissioner. We don't have anybody who can stand up in front of a podium and say, hey, you know, here's here's the real story. Um, well, again, maybe that's what CHRB should have done 
uh, when this whole thing got started. Um, they did drop the ball on this, no doubt about it. Yeah. And, and the fact that racing um, doesn't have a PR person or a PR body or agency. And, and then, uh, you know, Craig Robertson, who's representing Team Justify, issues a statement on, on Bob Baffert's behalf. And you half wonder, would it be, I mean, you, you don't want Baffert out there saying something that, that he shouldn't or just shooting from the hip, which he, he's known to do. Um, but, you know, would it have been better if Bob Baffert had addressed the media by himself? I disagree with you on nope. that, Alan, because lawyers lawyers don't let their clients do that because one slip of the tongue. I mean, you know, uh, Baffert is as media savvy as they come. But, um, you know, I've been dealing with this for a long, long time. And, you know, every every lawyer in the world tells their clients, let me do the talking uh, because you just, you know, you say the wrong thing. It comes back to bite you. So, uh, you know, um, I, I, I really uh, I, I really disagree with that. Baffert, you know, put out a statement and, and, and said what, what he needed to be saying. This is crap. Um, I, I unequivocally deny that that I, you know, drugged this horse uh, in, in the manner that it was written up. And, uh, and it's, it's just not so. And one more thing about um, the story that, um, you know, again, there's things that, again, talk about the man in the street not understanding. I don't even understand, you know, 4C drugs versus 3B drugs and everything. Never anywhere in that story did Drape make any attempt to explain that this was the, of all the classifications of illegal substances, this was considered by the RCI the least uh, serious of all possible drugs i just want to follow up on things something each of you said the I, I have a real life example i was at a birthday party on friday night and people were asking me about this justify thing and i had no idea what to say you know it's that's the problem and that goes to al's point that there's no unified message really or messenger in these situations and when, when people when the layman asks you you have a friend that doesn't really know about racing but knows you're into racing asks you about these things that there's no real official line to go with. Like, I can only estimate what happened. I, this had, had broken so quickly that, or so recently that I really had no idea what to say. But even going back to the, the Santa Anita breakdowns, it's like there's no official explanation for what's happening, what they're doing about it. So it's left to us to kind of educate the public one-on-one. -on -one, and I just don't think that's healthy for the sport. Oh, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, it gets back to why it, even though it'll never happen, why racing needs a commissioner. We needed Roger Goodell to step up to the podium with, you know, uh, and hold a press conference, um, uh, you know, maybe outside Churchill Downs or, or at, uh, outside San Diego or something like that, and 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 speak up for the industry and and, and tell tell the industry side of the story. And uh, uh, but you know, again, that's a pipe dream that that sort of thing is ever going to happen. But uh, you know, maybe they you know maybe they need to hire a crisis management firm. Well, they or did. They, it's yeah. the thing. I read the story about them hiring a crisis management firm for the San Anita thing like a couple months ago. A couple. What months did they ago. do? I never like, saw anything. Yeah, I, just, I forget where I read it probably in the thoroughbred daily news, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that should have been done in, in December or January. Like it's, it's, it's so foreign to a lot of people in racing to get out ahead of things. It's right. too reactive. Ex exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Moving on from the, that justify news. I'm sure there'll be some uh, trickle down news coming from that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully not, but I'm sure there will be. Um, we're going to move on to a quick preview of this weekend. Obviously, the big news this week is that Maximum Security will not be participating in the Pennsylvania Derby. Came down with a case of colic. It seemed to be pretty serious. Seems to have stabilized, at least now, for the moment. Um, you know, I, we, we talked about, when we first talked about the Pennsylvania Derby a couple of years ago, or a couple of weeks ago, we, we spoke about how we had to wait to see Maximum Security actually enter the starting gate before we penciled him in for this race just seems to be the kind of horse who's there's a, there's a lot of start and stop starts and stops with him and you know it's unfortunate that he's not going to compete but you know there's still there's still storylines to be to be discussed here the main one i think is you know he's become kind of the the forgotten horse i think as the summer has gone on and that's war of will he's he's the one horse in this race that kind of ha has bigger aspirations than than just this i would say that especially now who knows if we're going to see maximum security again this year? You know, if he misses the Breeders' Cup, 
I say no. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I interject. There's no way this horse yeah, is running again I would, this year. No, I, no way. Yeah, I, I yeah. wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. Can't, you can't go from the Haskell, uh, having missed all this time, all these problems, yeah. right into the Breeders' Cup Classic. Not, yeah, I know. But happening. then, even if he misses the Breeders' Cup, then you got the the, the what the, the cigar the mile and or, the and the Malibu. Could, or like, he could, you know, just get ready for his four. Yeah, no, I'm just. I mean, in terms of the championship race. Yeah, yeah. There's just there's a very few opportunities left, especially if a horse like Honor Code who's going in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. If he steps up and beats older horses, mm-hmm. I mean, he, he might be too far out in front anyway. But War of Will, I just wanted to, to touch on briefly, just because he's, he's kind of become the forgotten horse because he didn't run well in the Belmont. He didn't run well in the Jim Dandy. But if you go back after the Preakness, it felt like he was kind of a pretty solid leader in the three-year-old division because he had those graded stakes wins. He won the LeCompte and the Risen Star to start the year. Didn't run terribly in the Kentucky Derby. He was affected by that incident, obviously. And then I thought I had a pretty convincing win in the Preakness. He, he got a dream trip along the rail, but he was close to a fast pace. So I, I thought he earned that. But, yeah, didn't go forward in the Belmont or the Jim Dandy. So now, especially with maximum security sidelined, he could be the one to get that next grade one win as a three-year-old and start stacking them up. You know, he's he's come back, and he, it looks like he's been working really well. Seems to be a good workhorse, but he's drilled a couple of bullets at Belmont. So he's the one that I think the other horse that's interesting in here, but is not in the championship race is Mr. Money. He's, you know, Bill, you like your, uh, your baseball references. Mm-hmm. He seems like a, a horse that's kind of tearing it up in triple a. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, this is his first real step up in a top class company. Obviously would have been a tougher spot with maximum security in there. Still a grade one, still a decent field. You got improbable as well. So those are the two horses that I would really be interested in to see if Mr. Money can bring his talent to the big stage. And then if War will can kind of find new life to make a push in the second half last third or whatever we're in. Well, I guess so far as a three-year-old championship, you know, I mean, a lot of things could decide it. I mean, if if a three-year-old wins the Breeders' Cup uh, Classic, like War of Will or some of these other horses that um, we've talked about, like um, Code of Honor, then th- that probably would cement the three-year-old championship for them. But, you know, right now the two front runners are War of Will and Maximum Security, and we thought this race was going to kind of separate the two of them. Now we don't have Maximum Security in the race, and you have War of Will. I, you know, I, Joe, I, I agree with so much of what you said, but um, I never know if this horse is going to show up. He's so inconsistent. Uh, I mean, even before he lost his last two races, the Jim Dandy and the Belmont, I mean, he loses by 12 lengths in Louisiana Derby. Uh, then, of course, you know, he had that horrible trip where maximum security wiped him out uh, in the Kentucky Derby. Then he comes back and wins the Preakness. So, um, you know, Mark Cassie's had a lot. Mark Cassie's been pointing for this race. And, you know, he, he skipped the Haskell. He skipped the Travers. So, you know, I like it when, when horses, uh, excuse me, when trainers zero in on a particular race and, you know, they put all their efforts behind getting the horse primed for this particular day. This is like his Breeders' Cup Classic. But, you know, if he runs anything like he did in his last uh, two starts, he's not going to win. Um, you know, can he run back to the Preakness? Sure. But, uh, you know, right now, um, you know, uh, the, he's 5-1 to one on the morning line, which uh, has been changed since um, uh, maximum security came out. So I I don't know what he is now. He's probably about seven to two or something like that. But right now, I, I don't, you know, I don't think he can beat Improbable. Not, uh, you know, not the way Improbable uh, came back in the shared belief. So, you know, it's kind of a, if if he doesn't win, it's so far as a three-year-old championship, it, it, it's a moot point, and Maximum Security stays the leader in the clubhouse. Yep. I mean, I'm I'm a War of Will fan. Um, I don't know if you were here in the office on Derby Day, Joe, were you or not? No, I wasn't there. Okay. Well, I, I was um, I was doing the cheering for uh, <laughs> Team War of Will, um, and like the interesting thing, um, wh- whether he was a willing participant um, in the fact that he sort of switched off in the Derby. Now, yeah, I mean, he still raced um, keenly, but didn't have to lead. Um, wasn't speed crazy. G- uh, did get a good trip inside and switched off enough where. At the quarter pole, you thought that he was going to punch through there and kick on. And to be fair, um, even though he was bothered, he still had every chance at the eighth pole. It mm-hmm. just wasn't good enough. Now, whether the, whether the incident hampered him in any way or took something out of him is um, is hard to tell. M- my logic in, in the Brigness, where it, it was crazy overlay yeah, in my mind, that was stupid. Uh, was that hopefully he had learned something at Churchill? He learned to relax a little bit, and he got that good trip. 
he did settle better that day, got home better, and uh, and was convincing that day. Belmont, who knows what happened? Uh, he's warfront out of a Sadler's Wells. My leading theory is that he just didn't stay. Um, and then and he had the seven weeks off between the Belmont and the Jim Dandy. I think he was too fresh a horse in the Jim Dandy. He was speed, not necessarily speed crazy, but he was headstrong again and sort of ran himself out of the race. So I think if you see a more relaxed version of War of Will on Saturday, he's, he's got every chance. I'm not 100% sold on Improbable just yet. Um, I'm not sure I believe that comeback buyer. And um, Mr. Money's got some things to prove on, on class. Um, obviously, he fits on, on figures. But um, I, I'd be happy to give War of Will a chance. Only problem is that there just doesn't look to be a lot of speed in there. Mm -hmm. And getting back to the whole Eclipse Award scenario, we're, the voters are going to be faced with something that they've never been faced with before. If maximum security were not taken down in the Kentucky Derby, it, 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 there'd be no discussion. He, he'd be the three-year-old championship uh, to have won the Florida Derby, Kentucky Derby, and the Haskell. Um, that's Nobody's going to surpass that. He'd be the three-year-old champion. So Again, you know, maybe some horses can uh, string together some things that can surpass him. But how do voters treat the Kentucky Derby? I, I don't really know what to do with that. Um, you know, do you just say he finished 17th because that's what the official record says? Or do you say, well, you know, he won but put an asterisk next to it? I, I, I mean, I, I don't. You know, if if the year were over right now, he would be my three year old champion. But but um, again, I'm I'm 100 percent convinced he's not going to run against this, this year. And there's a couple big races that are still going to decide this thing. I really don't know what to do with the Derby. Um, anybody else? No, I mean I, that's kind of been a conundrum in, in my mind ever since it happened, really, and as, actually, especially since the Triple Crown wrapped up and things kind of became so up in the air in the three year old division. How are people going to look at that? I don't think you can call him the 17th place finisher in the Derby re reasonably. I, I, I think you don't want to call him the winner. You maybe call him, say he hit that's the board. That's a whole problem. What is he? Yeah, you know? that's the, yeah. So he, de he definitely affected other horses. He, he, I think he wiped out probably two or three horses in the Derby, but were those horses going to beat him anyway? Probably not. Yeah. So that's, I mean, you want to talk about the, the international jurisdictions. They might treat that. They might've treated that a little bit differently. I mean, Joe, I, I agree with you on two fronts. I definitely think he should have come down. Uh, I, I think it was an obvious DQ, and, uh, you know, all the fuss afterwards was ridiculous. Um, but I also think he was the best horse. Yeah. Um, you know, so again, you know, this, this whole thing now that we're all debating the class one versus class two rules, how that should be treated. Well, the, 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 the way it's treated in the United States of America under our rules a no brainer that he comes down in there. So, uh, but I, I just don't know if I, if I give him credit for the race or not. I mean, maybe I'll give him like, you know, partial credit, one third of a point or something yeah. like that. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, you know, honestly, now that he's, he's on the sidelines, I think it might end up being a moot point. Might not, might, nobody might step up and, and, and take charge here, but I think that brought off code of honor a little bit. I would disagree that, if he wins the Travers, the Jockey Club Gold Cup, and the Breeders' Cup Classic, I think even if you consider a maximum security the winner of the Kentucky Derby, I think that's a better threesome of grade one wins. I wouldn't disagree, but that's a lot of ifs. Yeah, though. no, yeah. for sure. But, yeah, yeah I, I just think either way, it's it's right for the picking still in almost October. I don't remember the last time that's happened. We usually had some kind of idea who was going to win this thing by now. I, you know, I'm uh, actually one of the people who did not agree with the DQ. I didn't think it was um, a no-brainer because, I, I mean, I I am a Category 1 follower. Um, I mean, Bill, you said something interesting. Uh, you said um, it was a no-brainer, and then the next breath you said he was the best horse. Well, but, but it, you know well, what? Well, listen, if he was the best horse, then the argument goes he shouldn't come down. Well, not, not under the rules. Uh, not under no, 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 I'm not saying. Under, now, now, you can make an argument the rules are stupid. And I wouldn't really necessarily disagree with you on that. 
but the rules are the rules. And, you know, um, again, talk about, you know, lack of transparency. Um, you know, uh, the California Horse Racing Board ought to hire the uh, Kentucky uh, uh, Derby stewards to go to work for them because they would fit in perfectly there. Um, you know, putting out a uh, two sentence statement and then like running to their cars to get out of the parking lot fast enough. But, um, you know, the, the if you looked up the rules in the, in the uh, you know, official uh, rules of Kentucky horse racing, it's clear cut that he should have come down, uh, you know, because of, of how how not only impeding horses, but severely impeding horses. Now, if you want to say that that's that there's other ways and, and better ways to do it as they do in other countries, um, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you with that. But, um, you know, they followed the, the rules set forth by the Kentucky uh, Horse Racing Commission and under those rules. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you're right. It sounds very hypocritical. He's the best horse but he deserved to come down. I understand exactly what you're saying, but I stick by my statement. He's the best horse. He should have come down. Yeah, I, well, I just wanted to branch that off briefly because there, there's, there's been a lot of talk about changing the disqualification rules. I think Pat Cummings has kind of been at the forefront of that with the Thoroughbred Idea Foundation trying to adapt these overseas disqualification rules. Al, you know more about this than me. My question about those rules is, A, if you – Disqualify the horse from purse money, but not in the wagering, which I've heard floated, is that you or you find the jockey and 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 the trainer, but you don't DQ the horse. Doesn't uh, doesn't that lead to the opposite problem that the person, the people who bet on the horse who got impeded or affected, don't they then have a gripe too? Because I get like right now, you want you bet on the best horse, like maximum security, you feel kind of screwed if he gets taken down, even though he was pro most likely going to win anyway. But doesn't that create the opposite problem that if you don't get put up and you have a horse that was interfered with, won't they be st screaming just as loud? I mean, in theory, yeah. Um, but then you look at it, you know, let's take this the, the derby, for example. Um, Country House was never winning the race. So, um, so anybody, Carl Broberg, did he back the horse? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, anybody that... Um, that had country house I mean, clearly backed in to the win. Um, like the greatest example, um, the most egregious example of a bad DQ was when Secret Jester won the Beverly D a few years ago. And what's the chances ends up being the winner because Secret Jester fouled Stephanie's kitten, who was never, ever winning. So, I mean, that's, that's a conundrum. How do you take down a horse that's clearly best. How do you put up a horse that was never going to cross the line first? But if if they but if they got cost the placing, like I don't remember what it was. Steffi's kitten got cost third, third or second in there. But if if you bet her and and she got cost the place because of secret gesture, how is that justice for you? Like why should you have to eat that? That because just because the horse who won was best, like. That's not my problem. My horse should have had a better position if they had run the race fairly. Cho, I can answer your question very simply. There is no perfect system. Right. right. That's well, it. Well, that's why it's worth discussing, I yeah. think, just because mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a lot of different ways to go on that. Um, and I, just, the, I, I think it does get a little dicey sometimes when a horse like Maximum Security is disqualified for interfering with the 17th place horse. At the same time, I think if you – change the rules to where you can just knock tiring horses out of your way if you have the best horse and you're going to try to win. I think it, it leads to a lot of, it could, I'm not going to say leads, but it could lead to careless riding where if you know that the horse in front of you is tiring and the horse isn't going to win the race, what's to stop you from cutting that horse off just to get through? Whereas this in this way, I think it leads to more careful riding that you can't pinch back or eliminate anybody because you might get DQ'd, and that's that's the benefit of it. I see, at least. I mean, I, you know, I think the uh, I think the penalty therein lies with having the latitude to penalize to suspend jockeys not for three days, but for fifteen or thirty days, and find them not two thousand dollars, but twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I mean, I think that can correct a lot of stuff. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And there's another good race, the Cotillion. Yeah, let's talk about the Cotillion. Um, so we are the. It's a good field, eleven horse field, a pretty deep group. Uh, looks like a ton of speed. Uh, that's the first thing I thought of. Reminded me a little bit 
of the acorn. So, of course, we have Ser- Serengeti Empress and uh, Gorana in here again. Jaywalk, Bellafina, a lot of different. Don't forget horses. about my Jersey bred horologist. Uh, horologist, of course, yes. one of the one of the top contenders as well. Um, so, Bill talked to Chad Brown about Gorana earlier. Here's what he had to say. Well, the cotillion at Parks is just loaded. Philly is up and down the map with grade ones. Got a Kentucky Oaks winner and Serengeti Empress. But there's a horse in here that gives people the impression that she might be not just special, but extra special. And I'm talking about Garana, trained by Chad Brown. And, and Chad, do you get that impression as well? Three for three, some of her wins have been just so easy that they're the type that your jaw drops. Um, am I on the right track? Could she be one of those really special horses? Yeah, I mean, I'd be hard-pressed to think of any other horse I've trained to start their career off better than her. She's been, you know, impressive in all three starts, ultra impressive, actually, and uh, she's really done nothing wrong. And April 19th of her three-year-old year, why why'd she get off to a late start? And she's had some baby issues at two, nothing real serious, and just, you know, took some patience and, the team at Three Chimneys really did a terrific job. They just uh, gave her the time she needed and um, <clears throat> delivered her back to us uh, over the winter down in Florida, and we just took her time with it. Okay. Now, going back to her first start, which is where uh, everybody started to get excited about her, uh, you win a maiden race that came on by 14 and three-quarter lengths. Uh, you obviously know you have a good horse, but were you were even you taken uh, by surprise a little bit that she was that dominant? Yeah, uh, we you know we expected her to run really well, and even expect you know expected her to win. But to win by that large of a margin, first time out, so easy, and I was thinking back. Okay, and then to come back in the acorn, same story. You run against the Kentucky Oaks winner, <laughs> and beat her by six lengths. Uh, then you must have really known you had something special. Yeah, she was training brilliantly. It's really, it wouldn't be a normal for me to throw a horse in a grade one like that. Um, but she's training so good, and. I, it's only really one horse to beat in there, so we took a shot. There's always some risk involved when you do that, right? I mean, you could right. really set her development back and have a lot of egg in your face if it doesn't work out. But thankfully, it did work out. And she showed her brilliance. Mm-hmm. Now, Chad, you've already been a lot of good horses, Serengeti Empress included, but th- this is clearly the toughest field you've ever had to face. I mean, this race came up very, very strong. Uh, you, you're the favorite. You're the deserving favorite. But, um, you know, if, if she were to win this, can she she rise any higher in your estimation uh, with a victory over this quality of field? Yeah, I mean, this will be the toughest race she's been in, like you said, but there's always room to aim higher, you know, that being running against older horses. And uh, you have to keep climbing the ladder and aiming higher with her, and, um, and that's what we'll do right now. I feel good about going into the race. She's had plenty of time to recover off her race in Saratoga. Uh, she was um, really tested for the first time and, and and really got to the wire first and and I needed some time to fill up her tank, if you will, mm-hmm. after that. And I really love what I'm seeing in the mornings mm-hmm. with her. Uh, trainers hate it when journalists ask these questions, but if you're to win this race, um, I would imagine Breeders' Cup this step is next. Then you have to go against the older horses, some of whom are very, very good, uh, like Alayda and Midnight Bisu, and who knows, even Madame White Girl might uh, have time to make the race. Uh, how do you feel she stacks up against them uh, and you know, your feelings about trying that level of competition? Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other level there when you talk about those two fillies. I have a lot of respect for them. And uh, we'll just have to see how she handles this. I mean, she's she's looking running a mile and an eighth. And, if she takes another step forward here, it's something we'd be open to. Okay. Chad, good luck Saturday. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the call. Take care. All right. Thoughts on the million-dollar cotillion, Bill? Um, I think it's a really good race, and um, with maximum security's defection, um, uh, I, I think it's an even more interesting race than, than the Pennsylvania Derby now. Um, it, it It's really loaded, but I, I've been a Garana fan um, from from the first time she broke her maiden. Um there are some very, very good fillies in here. And this is um, probably the best three-year-old filly race uh, field assembled uh, all year long. Um, At least it's the Oaks. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. At least, uh, at least since the Oaks. Um, I mean, there's some just really, really tough horses in here, and you have the Oaks winner, Serengeti Empress, who was uh, seven to two and got her doors blown off by Garana um, in in the Acorn Stakes. So, um, but I, Garana, it, it looks to me like there's a lot of very good horses in here. Um, I don't think she's earned the the right to be called great or anything like that yet. But if there's one horse in here that is going to be in the Hall of Fame someday, it's Garana. Mm. Um, she reminds me of Rachel Alexandra. Now, I mean, that's, that's, I, I know Somebody's I'm going to hose Bill down. OK, yeah, I know I'm going too far, <laughs> but um, we'll talk about this after she wins by by seven in the, this race and then goes out and wins. Well, I don't know if she can win the Beers Cup to staff against those older mayors. Rachel just, would have done that. Yeah. Um, those, but, but she just, there's just something about her that she just looks like she's cut from a different cloth from the rest of these horses. And, um, you, you know, you go back to that acorn where she won by six lengths over Serengeti Empress. Um, you know, Serengeti Empress is no slouch. That's a Kentucky Oaks uh, winner. And it was their second lifetime start coming off a maiden win at six and a half furlongs. Now, I know she only won the coaching club by a length. But, you know, it was a pretty measured length. And that point of honor was like the hottest horse in the world. Everybody was, was you know, touting that horse and saying, you know, Grana's going to get a, her come up and today. Um, you know, yeah, I am getting a little bit carried away. But uh, I, I, I just think that she's got unlimited potential. All right. Uh, definitely a lot of speed on, on paper. Um, and let's keep in mind in the acorn that Serengeti Empress was pressed through half mile sub 44 <laughs> And Guarana, yeah. you know, got the perfect sit off of them, and then uh, and then she really exploded. I mean, she finished um, she finished up running. She's clearly um, a talented um, a talented filly. Um, I, I mean, I think this race sets up beautifully for Street Band. Um, I think she ran a sneaky good race in the Alabama, and um, you know, she's just a horse that that seems to have gotten better as, as the years gone on. Her victory at um, and Indiana, you might say it's just the Indiana Oaks, but um, she won that with a fair bit of authority. And, um, you yeah, know, she was in pretty deep in the uh, in the Alabama at a distance that might stretch her pedigree a little bit. And um, she certainly, you know, she made a, a move there. She, you know, looked like she was in with a big shot there at the eighth pole and then just sort of tailed off there at the finish. But uh, to finish third to those two fillies was, I thought, um, I thought a very good effort and... You know, if the uh, dreaded park speed bias doesn't kick in on uh, on Saturday, I think she'd have a fair shot at winning. And you also got to stay away from the rail. That's that's generally the case at parks. Uh, I agree with both of you guys. Uh, St- Street Band, I liked in the Alabama. I was a little bummed that she just missed second. But, yeah, she ran. That was a big step up in class, and she ran well. Guarana, I agree. I'm not going to go as far as the Rachel <laughs> comparisons. But greatest Philly that ever lived. How about that? All right. We'll we'll put that we'll put that up on the wall when yeah. Garana wins. Um what a drilled Zenya. But uh but uh but I, I agree that she does have the highest ceiling of anybody in this field. I would think I would say by a good margin that if she does reach her true potential, she is gonna be the best of this class. And you know, we talk about the three year old male division, three year old Philly division, she's I think has a pretty good uh, pretty good lead in that as well because she's got the multiple grade one wins. As far as I know, no one else has any. I don't know if you guys know of anyone, but I don't think anyone else has, any, has multiple grade one wins in the three-year-old Philly division. Well, but, th- this race could change all right. that. Right, yeah, yeah. But, now, but hold on, but my my, yeah. my problem with, with Garana was that that was the easiest trip she's ever going to get in the coaching club American Oaks, and she was still weaving out in the stretch and really just kind of barely held on. Point of Honor is a nice horse, but Point of Honor was way against it that day. She was last, and I think came home in like 35 and change just to get second. So I think Guarana definitely does have the most ability of anybody in this field, but I think there's a reason they didn't put her in the Alabama because they saw her getting a little tired late in that last furlong of the Coaching Club American Oaks. She still came home okay. She still came home in pretty fast time, but visually – you would expect with those kind of fractions at the top of the lane, she's supposed to open up on that field, and she just didn't. And that would be my my trepidation with her is that 
maybe down the line she's a little better going a one-turn mile than she is a two-turn horse. Well, one counterpoint on that, um, why run her against her stable mate Dunbar Road uh, when, you know, Brown's got probably – May, might have the two best three-year-old fillies in the country, and you know he, he's trying to manage them to, to, to separate them. So, so that would re, re, uh, some argument against you know your 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 thoughts about the Alabama. Now, do you notice we've been talking about this race for five or six minutes, and nobody has mentioned Jay Walk, last year's two-year-old filly champion, yeah. and it's like she's just an afterthought in this well, race. Well, I mean, other than that Delaware race, it's it's hard to make a case for her from this year's form, and also she drew the eleven hole a bunch of other speed to her inside she's done her best running when she's on the lead so she's either gonna have to go pretty wide and rally for the first time or she's gonna have to be setting a really really fast pace and it just it doesn't it doesn't seem like the race sets up for her to me yeah and it just looks like you know um she's the kind of horse that didn't progress from her two to three year old year yeah. she's just stayed the same and uh uh, even John Green, who joined us on the podcast, who's the part owner, um, a couple weeks ago, kind of admitted that, that, uh, you know, the, the rest of the Phillies have just caught up to her. But just to the point about um, uh, in Guarana and, and Dunbar Road, would you have said after the acorn that Chad's going to be avoiding Dunbar Road with <laughs> Guarana? I don't think so. I think that was a little more calculated that she didn't want to go 10 furlongs. Yeah, well, it could be, but, you know, it, it's, you know, it's a nice problem to have, but, but, you know, Chad Brown has got to do the best he can keeping these horses apart. And, uh, you know, especially in turf races where, you know, he, he just can't, you know, Mm -hmm. he winds up uh, in some of these turf races with, you know, three, four horses or the entire Um, field, like the the entire field. Right. Um, you know, there is, you you know, you, you could be absolutely right, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, if he's going to properly manage both these fillies, he doesn't want them to meet till the Breeders' Cup mm-hmm. um, distaff. And, um, you know, so, you know, why put them both in the same race? Um, it, whereas uh, they're going to be the favorite uh, and, and, you know, one. So, wh- you know, why why set one up to lose when you don't have to? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm also I think I'm willing to give her the benefit of the doubt for, for the Oaks, not that she really needs it. But, you know, she went from six and a half up to the mile to win the Acorn and then out to the two-turn mile and an eighth. Um, so, you know, it was her first time going around two turns. Um, you know, maybe you could attribute her uh, her sort of leg weariness to just a little bit of greenness even. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to um, forgive, quote-unquote, that effort. Um, and look, she's, um, she's quality. She could, she could win this if for some reason she gets loose. I don't see that on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, the cotillion has one of the oddest conditions in all of horse racing, and that is that you'll see that Geltrin, for example, carries 122, and then Guarana, Serengeti, Empress, Bellafina as grade one winners have a two-pound penalty. Mm. It's extremely odd. It was more odd in 2010 when Blind Luck and Hob de Grace ran in this race. Joe knew I would work. <laughs> so, I mean, those, you know, they, those two fillies were uh, barely separable, and Blind Luck had to give her 10 pounds that day. And if Blind Luck had given her 8 pounds, <laughs> she probably wins that race. Oh, uh, what, what price would Blind Luck be in this race? Let's <laughs> talk about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting race in an interesting division. You know, the three-year-old male division obviously dominates the headlines for good reason. But this is an interesting division as well. And we'll have a lot more answers after Saturday at Parks. We'll do a brief recap of last week's racing. Uh, nothing nothing too earth-shattering. But uh, th- we, d- we talked about him last week. So we should, we should follow up on Dennis's moment, who went off as a big favorite in the Iroquois and, and, and did what was, was, was expected of him, broke pretty okay tracked the pace professionally, ran away in the stretch, and was pretty much eased up for the final 16th of a mile. I think the final running t- or margin was about two lengths. I think it could have been a lot more Length than that. Length and three quarters. Yeah, so it, I think anybody watching the race knows that he could have won him by a lot more. Although, he, you get to give a lot of credit to the runner-up. You know, Scabbard, formerly Noose, <laughs> um, had some trouble on the turn, got stopped a little bit, and really w- was running on late. It was a little... Little illusory because Irad had wrapped up on Dennis's moment, but still n- n- enough to give you hope for that horse going forward, especially stretching out. So uh, Dennis's moment, I would say, is is pretty clear cut favor right now for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. We won't 
project all the way to the Kentucky Derby like last year. But interesting thing with him is he reminds me a lot of not this time. And we touched on this a little bit last week, but he's a, he's a distance bred horse. Not this time was bred by, was by Giants Causeway, Dennis's Bowman by Tisnow, two sires. You, you think about more getting route types. And they both were highly touted for their debuts. I think uh, not this time went six furlongs. Dennis's Bowman went five or five and a half. Both had trouble. Not this time, I think, got kind of buried in traffic. This horse lost the jockey and still ran huge. Then they both went to Alice, where they laid over a field and beat up on that group by double digits. I think not this time we went a mile. This this horse went seven furlongs. And then they both went to the Iroquois, where they were highly touted, and, and they really came through. Obviously, Dale Romans tried to get on today. Not able to get a hold of him, but maybe sometime before the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. I think he's he, he probably has the steps laid out pretty going pretty far down the line for this horse. And I think he probably did for not this time as well, but it just didn't work out. He, he couldn't stay together after he running second to classic empire in the breeders cup. But Dennis's moment, I'm guessing has a, has a long-term plan right now. And the next stop is the breeders cup. And I just, I couldn't find anything to fault with his performance right there. I'm not into betting two to five shots, but you know, as, as, as far as they go, he w- he was pretty convincing. I, th- I think the one thing is people may look at is um, even though it was just a maiden race that, you know, 19 and a quarter length win at Ellis and, you know, that that's just a number. You just don't see that often. Then he only wins the Iroquois by a length and three quarters, granted against much tougher competition. But Joe, I, I, I think your point is well taken. It, it was, um, he was geared down. It was a very, very easy win. Uh, y- you know, you can't ever say these things for sure, but um, you know, if, if, if the jockey wanted, I, Rod Ortiz, you know, really wanted to let him run a little bit more in the last, um, you know, 200 yards or so. He probably does win by five lengths or something. Mm -hmm. Um, There's nothing not to like about him. I I mean, you know, um, very professional horse, well-bred. And, uh, you know, again, long, long, long way to go till we see uh, who lines up in the starting gate for the Kentucky Derby next year. Hopefully not a horse that has a scopamine positive on the record. Um, (laughs) We won't know until 2021. So who cares? Yeah. Yeah, right. But um, no, um, you uh, you were very high on him uh, uh, when we talked about this horse last time out. And uh, um, I was a little bit skeptical off because, you know, I said, oh, he just won at Ellis Park. Big deal. But uh, no, I'm joining the fan club. Yeah. And especially, like I said, with that pedigree, you would think stretching out even further than that would probably be no problem. Al, any takeaways? Uh, you know, not to um, not to repeat what you guys have said, but. Um, I thought he did it the right way. I mean, he, you know, he had enough speed. He probably had speed enough to lead them if he wanted, mm-hmm. but was happy enough. Um, and they knew that, that they had horse enough to, to stalk that pace. They sat there three wide without cover. And, and um, you know, it wasn't um, push button acceleration, I wouldn't say. But when I read asked him to, to take it up three, three eighths from home, um, you know, he claimed them pretty easily and uh, opened up on them pretty quickly and then put the race to bed. Uh, soon after that, so uh, I, I agree. There's no uh, there's no fault in the performance. Um, sounds like Dale's going to train him right up to the Breeders' Cup. Um, I was kind of hoping, uh, as somebody that's going to Keeneland in three weeks, that he hey. might show up there in the Breeders' Futurity. But <laughs> um, sounds like they're not going to squeeze the lemon dry that way, and and we'll see him again on the uh, first Saturday of November. Uh, his buyer number did drop from a 97 to a 90. But I think, again, if you watch the race yeah. and the way he was ridden and the way he was really not asked, um, I don't think that's anything that, uh, you know, any knock on him. Um, uh, he, he probably could have run the 97 again if, if Irod Ortiz wanted to really push him. Mm-hmm. All right, that's it for this week on the TDN Writers' Room. We uh, we always say we're going to keep this to <laughs> about a half hour, and then we get in here and we start talking and it ends up a little longer. But... We hope you're enjoying it. And for Bill Finley and Alan Carrasso, I'm Joe Bianca. We'll see you next week.